Good morning. Happy Sabbath. We would like to invite you, those who are outside, to come in and worship God with us. And we would like to welcome you to Pure Up Seven Day Adventist Church, whether you're a visitor or you're uh, watch us online. We would like to welcome you. And uh, it's just uh, amazing to see many new faces. I just met a new family who just moved from Hawaii. And they say that this is their home church. And I said, that's, that's, that's right. I think so too. So we would like to welcome you to our Pure Up Church. And uh, there are many uh, new faces that I s met last couple of weeks ago. Um, and uh, they choose this church as their home church. And uh, so if you haven't chosen your church, this is the church that I would like to recommend. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming and joining us and worship God. Let us stand as we give God the glory in song and praise Him. Oh 
Please be seated. How many of us would like to see your sons and daughter, your father and mother, aunt and uncle in the kingdom of God? I know I do. I've been praying for my family over 25 years. Hopefully someday they will be in the kingdom of God. Let us sing this song. It's a beautiful hymn song. It's not a new, it's an old, old song. Bring them in. God. Heart is the shepherd's voice I hear Out in the desert dark and drear Calling the sheep who've gone astray Far from the shepherd's fold away Bring them in, bring Sheltered from the cold, bring them in, bring them in, bring them in from the fields of sin, bring them in, bring them in, bring the wanderers to Jesus. Out in the desert, hear their cry. Out on the mountains, wild and high, heart is the master speaks to thee. Go find my sheep wherever they be. Bring them in, bring them in, bring them in from the fields of sin. Bring them in, bring them in, bring the wanderers to Jesus. The next song is Wonderful, Merciful Savior. How many of you feel the merciful hand upon us? I'm so grateful that we serve the God, the loving God, the merciful God. He ready to forgive us our sins. Let us sing from our hearts to our Lord Savior. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Counselor, comforter, keeper, Spirit, we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. Oh, we hopelessly lost the way. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. 
to find us falling before your throne. Oh, we're falling before your throne. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace. Our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. You are the we praise you are the one we adore you give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for oh our hearts always hunger for amen Our next song is Precious Lord, Take Our Hands. I know that all of us want our precious Lord to guide and lead us in our life every day, right? That's the only hope that we have. Whether we're going through tough time in this world, God promised that he'll be with us, right? Amen. And we pray that God will lead and guide us every day in our life, whatever we do. Trust in him. Let us sing this song. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, help me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, take me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord. prayer. And I'd like to invite any of you that want to come forward and to bring your burdens to the Lord or your praises or whatever might be on your heart. And um, as we lift our voices in prayer together to our precious Lord, um, I invite you to come forward at this time while we sing the last couple verses of our song. When my way Precious Lord, linger near when my life is almost gone. Hear my cry, hear my call, hold my hand lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When the darkness appears, Father, <clears throat> we lift our voices in prayer to you this morning. There are represented here many, many burdens, many, many heartaches, many people that we want to bring into your fold. And Lord, we just pray that you will draw close to each one. You know the burdens on each heart. You know the prayers that sometimes we can't even voice because they are so painful. But Lord, we just pray that you will bless each one of us, guide us closer to you, bring our loved ones and family and friends into the fold, Lord, and use us. Let us be used by you to, to invite them in. <clears throat> Lord, we also recognize that this week has, has marked a, a glaring problem in our country of division and of, and of 
um, anger and of, of pain and hatred and, and racism and whatever it might be, Lord. And we know that we may never see our nation healed because we know your coming is really soon. But Lord, we pray that you will use each one of us. Let us be that healing balm to those that we are in, in contact with, that they will see a different spirit in us, that they will see one of love, one of acceptance, one of, of unity, and that they will be drawn to want to know what group of believers has this kind of love and unity, and it's only you through us, Lord. We pray that you will help us to, to recognize even, even our Facebook posts or whatever it might be, that we be always filtering our thoughts as to and our comments as to what you would have us to say, what we can re represent you in the best way to bring that healing and that loving touch to those around us that are hurting and that are confused or that are angry. Lord, we want to um, pray also for all of our Bible study contacts that many of us in the church are reaching out to and around the conference. Lord, we want to see a rich harvest. We want to see many new faces in this church that are souls that you've won for your kingdom. Use us, Lord. Help us to be instruments. But we pray especially for all of those that have started studying or have received lessons, that your Holy Spirit will be with them, that the angels will surround them and protect them from the devil's distractions and prejudices and whatever might come in the way of them hearing your truth. And we ask for that especially in these coming weeks, Lord. We want to lift up um, Travis Culver again, Lord, and, and pray for healing, pray for encouragement and strength for all the family and for him in, in particular, Lord, that you will draw close to him. And we pray um, for our pastor today, Lord, that you will anoint his lips and, and give him a message that we need to hear and prepare our hearts, Lord, to to receive that message and to be willing to change and to be more like you each day. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. In your name, amen. Amen. Morning, church. That was pretty hearty. I don't even have to do a second on that. Um, as was mentioned in our prayer, we have many Bible studies going on in this greater Puyallup area. In fact, uh, well over 1,300 people responded to our mailed-out invitations, and, and that's about 20 churches involved. For us here, we have over 100 people that responded uh, that we are, have been following up on. This is all leading up to our incredible meetings, Revelation Speaks Peace, a four and a half week series that is going to begin uh, just around the corner. We're what, seven weeks away now. And our speaker from the Voice of Prophecy, Sean Boonstra, has a message he would like to share regarding that series of meetings, but it involves a bulletin insert. So if you open your bulletins, you will find a couple of Revelation Speaks Peace inserts one is letting you know how you could help and uh, be a part of this series of meetings, which we believe is going to have a lot of rejoicing at the end because of people coming closer to Christ. The other one has a list for names to be filled in, and we will let our speaker via video, Sean Boonstra, talk about that, and then I'll come up for the offering call. weeks to go before the meetings open down here at the Puyallup Fairground. So I thought I'd come down here and walk the property and do a lot of praying. Places like this are really important to me personally. It was in an evangelistic auditorium that I gave my heart to Christ, well, almost a quarter century ago. And I know what's about to happen down here. I've seen it all over the place. These people who show up, God has been working with them for years, sometimes decades. Bring them to the moment where we get to meet them. So the auditorium is going to become holy ground. It's going to be this convergence point where people from every walk of life who have been hearing the voice of God speak to them for years and years and years all come together. 
and together you and I are going to share the everlasting gospel with them. They're going to hear truth that makes sense to them because God got them ready for that moment. So I'm walking these grounds, thinking about these people. I don't know their names yet. You do know some of their names. So here's what I'd like you to do. Pray over those names. Ask God to show you where God is working in some people's lives around you so that you can ask them to join you down here at the auditorium. There's just weeks to go. This isn't something that happens in a matter of hours, days, or weeks. This is going to be the cumulative effect of a lifetime for these people. It'll be the biggest moment in their lives. So I'm asking you to join me. If you get a chance, drive down to the fairgrounds, walk around at once and pray over it. But then go through your neighborhood, walk past those houses, pray about it. Pray that the handbills that are going to go there in a few weeks would actually make a giant impact. We've discovered over the years that prayed over literature, prayed over handbills are far more effective than ones that are just placed in the mail. Then make a list of your friends. Ask God to show you where he's working with them in their lives, what he's been saying to their hearts, and then ask him for an opportunity to ask them to join you down here at the Puyallup Fairgrounds. This is going to be one of the greatest moments in everybody's lives, not just their lives, but ours too. Every time I do this, I grow as a Christian. I see things I've never seen before. I see things that you read about in the book of Acts, and you're going to see them too. But not unless we spend weeks together praying about it and then asking people, and then we all meet here to see what God's going to do to answer our prayers. Just weeks to go. Don't forget, this is the time to pray. And we do have a special prayer emphasis coming up just around the corner as well that you will continue to hear more about. Here at Puyallup Church, we have condensed our mission statement into something very short but profound. Can we say that together? Know Jesus and share his love. Part of how we do that involves money. Yes, I said the word, the M word in church. And here at Puyallup Church, we have four main giving values, all under the umbrella of stewardship. Stewardship is a word that uh, has been used more in the past, but uh, we think of it as management, and we have a very, again, simple, easy-to-remember definition of what true Christian stewardship is, and I'd like that to be said together, too, even with some emotion, huh? Here it is. Let's read it together. Stewardship is managing God's blessings, God's ways, for God's glory. So, how do we do that? Through our four main giving values here at the Puyallup Church. We have tithe and local church budget, building fund, and Christian education. What do those all mean? Let's break it down. Tithe. Tithe is the 10% God says return to me that directly funds Bible workers and pastors, specifically here in western Washington when we give it here. But it, eventually more, some of that money trickles on into other realms, even spreads around the, the world to share the gospel. Then we have local church budget. That's something I'll talk to you a little bit more about with a story, but just the basic, it funds the way we pay for resources to do our ministry of sharing Jesus here in our locality. Then we have a building fund. We could say mortgage payment, but this sounds better. It pays the mortgage so that we could have this building in which we house both a school and this gym turns into a sanctuary every Sabbath because you are paying the mortgage on it. Last but certainly not least, we believe in Christian education here and we could elaborate about that, but basically this fund is for students who otherwise could not be here unless they receive some monetary help. So that's what that fund is for, our four main giving values. Now today's particular call is for local church ministry. So I would like to connect with a story. How does local church ministry and this, these upcoming meetings and that bulletin insert with a, a list of blanks for us to fill in names of people we're going to associate with and pray for and invite to the meetings, how do those two things go together? Little story. Back in 1981, I was baptized, committed my life to Jesus Christ in May of 1981 way back when I had hair. And it was a beautiful experience, and I wanted to share the joy I was experiencing in my new relationship with Jesus with other people. So without anybody telling me, I literally made a list of my friends, my coworkers, people in my neighborhood, people in my family that I wanted to share Jesus with. One of those names was a guy named Rich. Rich had been in my life for about 15 years at that time. We were on a little league team together, a bowling team together. We did a number of things. He lived just a few doors down from me. 
But because Rich had a little bit more uh, wherewithal and I was a little poorer, I stayed in my Chicago area for community college while he went to university. After four years, he came back, after a little bit more than that. But uh, he came back shortly after I was baptized. And when he called me up, he invited me to go to a place I used to frequent as a non-Christian. That's the PG version. And I said, Rich, there's been a change in my life, and I'd like to tell you about it. I'll take you out for supper. So we went to a restaurant. I shared how God had led in my life and what he had brought me to, and Rich seemed interested. So we would talk about that from time to time. I invited him to come to my church. We were holding a series of meetings similar to what we're going to hold at the fairgrounds. And I said, Rich, it's very simple. I am going to bug you and bug you and bug you and bother you to come to these meetings. As long as you come to just one, I'm off your back. You won't hear me talk about it again. But I'm going to bother you till you come to, to just one. And he chuckled, but he, he came to like the second or third meeting. And he came to many subsequent meetings that we held in my local church building where I attended. As a result of people funding the local church ministry, we were able to do that evangelistic series, have people congregating together where Rich met other people that he could be friends with, and Rich a year later was baptized. And now, since 1982, he has been serving his local church as a deacon, as a Sabbath school teacher, as a musician, and as a singer. And I believe there are other people who've come to Jesus through Rich's ministry, which all came together because people gave to local church budget and some guy who had recently come to Christ prayed over and associated with people. I believe that happens here. So please use those sheets, give some of the funds God has asked you to give, and let's all rejoice together in what happens for God's glory. I'd like to ask the ushers to stand. Let us pray. Oh, by the way, one final announcement. If you have given anything to the Puyallup Church in 2016, there are some uh, tithe and donation statements in the hallway that are for you for tax purposes. Uh, that should be very uh, important to you. We'll leave it at that. Pick them up in the foyer on your way out. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you have given so much to us that we're able to give to your cause and partner with you, Lord, partner with you. Help us, Lord, to be sensitive to your spirit so that we do write down the names of people you want us to pray over daily and associate with and eventually invite to these meetings. And help us, Lord, to sense your pleasure as we do that and as we give back some of the money that you've allowed us to have. Please, Lord, guide all of every fund, every penny, every dollar, so that it goes to your cause in an efficient way and ultimately ends up glorifying you. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, yes, and this is time for children's stories. So the children become collectors of your kind generosity. That money goes to our building fund. Come on, kids, come on up. Put it right here in the little church. And we will move this.
Happy Sabbath and good morning. I am so glad to see all of you. Well, on this Sabbath day, I have a very big question for you. So can you put your thinking caps on? Put your thinking caps on. All right, here's the question. What do you worry about? Do you know what that word means, worry? You can, you can maybe describe it for us. What does that mean? To be scared or... Another, nervous is another good word. Any other words that might help describe worry? What it means to worry, fear. Maybe you're scared of something. Have you ever seen, maybe when your parents get worried, have you seen their eyebrows go like this? You see them furrow together like this? Can you do that with me? You go like that, your eyebrows go together, and he kind of scrunches up like that. You see that? <laughs> so maybe you've, maybe you've seen that. How many of you have ever worried about something before? Been scared about something? Or been afraid? We don't have very many scared kids here. This is great. Your mom and dad are worried? Yeah, sometimes mommies and daddies get worried about a lot of things. Well, how about nervous? Have you heard that word before? Nervous? Yeah, you get nervous. You've been nervous before? Yeah, what kinds of things make you nervous or scared? Meeting new people. Ooh. <coughs> Have any of you gone to a new school before? Or making new friends? You've got one? <gasps> Meeting new Korean sisters. You could be a little nervous because you want to make a good impression, huh? You want to be friends. So there's lots of things in life that can make us scared or worried. Some of them are not super scary things, maybe like making new friends, like our Korean friends that have come to visit us. That's not as scary. But maybe having bad dreams, that's something that could be really worrisome. That might make you worry, huh? Well, when I was a little girl, and when I was your age, sometimes I would get so worried and I would go to sleep at night, and I'd have a bad dream, and I'd be scared that my house was going to burn down. And I'd have this dream over and over again. Have any of you ever had dreams like that? Scary dreams? Yeah? Scary dreams? Or sometimes I would get worried that something would happen to my sister, and maybe she would get hurt. Or I'd be scared that when my daddy went to work, maybe he would get in a car accident. And I would get so worried, and I'd be so scared, and I'd get something inside that I called the Bernie feeling. Do you ever get a feeling inside when you're scared? Maybe inside your heart you just feel a little bit worried or nervous. And oh, I would just be so worried and I didn't know what to do. Well, my mom and my dad taught me some important lessons because I would get so worried. And they would remind me that Jesus can take all our worries away. So I need one volunteer to come and help. Well, I'm going to use one of the big girls, Maya, since you raised your hand first, since you're a little bit bigger, and then maybe the little, one of the little kids can try. So let's think of a worry. What's a worry that you might have or something you might get scared about? Ooh, you lost a shoe. She's got some good ones here. What's another one? If you lost a slipper, that's a shoe too. What's something else? Oh, if you lost your favorite dress, lots of losing things. Oh, if you lost your family, that would be a big worry. Okay, so let's see here. What is this? A napkin. It's a napkin from Subway. <laughs> So maybe you lost your slipper, and here's your worry. We're going to place that worry on you. Is that a very heavy worry? No. no, it doesn't really do much. She'll find her slipper eventually. She'll probably be okay. But let's see. What if, what if you lost your favorite dress? That's, that's a worry. What is, what is this that she's holding? Can you see it? A paper clip. How heavy is a paper clip? Not super heavy. Well, if you lost your dress, you can, you can get a new one at the store. So it's not a super big worry. <laughs> Who knows? But what if she lost her family? Let's see how heavy is this worry. Whoa, I can hold it for you if it's too heavy. 
How heavy is that worry? Can you see? What number is on there? Five pounds. And for you guys, five pounds is probably a lot. That's a big worry. Don't hurt yourself. Now, what if, let's see, you've got boots on, so we might be able to make this work. What's another big worry she could have? <gasps> what if her pet died? She has three pets. That would be a huge worry. Let's see what happens if you put this on your foot. Let's see, maybe teacher Tracy can help us put it around her foot. Now, let's see, can you try and walk around with that? What does it feel like? Is it heavy? It's heavy like it has rocks in your boots or something? That's kind of heavy. What's going to start happening? Is she going to want to run and play anymore? She might want to sit down. You could sit down if you want to if that makes it easier or something. Is that hard? What, what, what are we going to do about these worries? Who can take away the worries? <gasps> Jesus. Maybe teacher Tracy can help us. And she can represent Jesus taking away those worries. Now what? What can she do if she takes away all of those worries? Now Maya's free. You can go sit down. Thank you. <laughs> she has no more worries. She can move around. She can move her feet again. She can move her arms again. It's not heavy. Sometimes worries can feel like that. They can feel really heavy. Like if your pet dies or if something happens to your family, it can be scary. You could be scared of those things happening. But Jesus has the power to take all our worries away. I have a Bible verse for you of something that Jesus said that I want you guys to help me remember. Do you think you can help me remember this? Okay, let's come up with some motions. So Jesus says, come to me. What could we do for that motion? Like this? Okay, Nicole's got to go like this. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. What could we do for that one? People, all the people, all you. What about sleeping, who are weary or tired? and burdened, and I will give you rest. What motion could we do for that? Rest. Oh, sleep. We'll do sleep for that because sleep is rest. So can we say it together? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. One more time. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus said those words, and he wants us to remember that no matter what worries it is that you have in your life, or what things you're scared about, or maybe the bad dreams you have, no matter what those things are, Jesus is stronger than all of that, and he can take all of those worries away. Do you think you guys can remember that today? You can remind your parents, too. All right. Have a very good Sabbath, and I'll see you later. The title of our song today is Side by Side We Stand, Awaiting God's Command. Happy Sabbath. Side by side we stand, 
awaiting God's command, worshiping the saving King, living by His grace and moving on in faith. Jesus Himself will see us through. Meet me in heaven with joy hands together. Meet me by the Savior's side. I'll meet you in heaven. We'll sing songs together. Sisters, I'll be there. So there's all are we to go where Jesus leads. We'll fight in faith and we will overcome. Heaven is our goal and saving every soul. I'll be there. Meet me in heaven. We'll join hands together. Meet me by the Savior's side. I'll meet you in heaven. We'll sing songs together. I'll be there Brothers and sisters I'll be there Praise the Lord we are all will be Amen. Thank you so much for the gift of music and worship. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. And welcome to Puyallup Seventh-day Adventist Church Second Service. Those of you who are visiting, regulars, and of course those joining us via live stream, it is so good to, ha good to have you here. I hope you've had a good week. It hasn't been too stressful. And uh, no matter who is president, Jesus is king. So I just want to remind us of that. If you have your bulletins, go ahead and pull them out. I want to... Uh, Direct your attention to just a couple special things here. First, in the lobby, we are having continual sign up for our photo directory. We have a beautiful community, a beautiful congregation, and we'd like to get to know each other better. And sometimes when you come to church, you know that you know people, but you can't remember a name. So we really want to try to eliminate that by having a nice photo directory. So please go and sign up in the lobby. Uh, spots are filling up quick. Uh, also, 10 Days of Prayer is happening February 1st. And we have Kevin Wolfie from the conference who's going to be help leading that. There's going to be child care. So there's there's no excuse to not have some more prayer in your life as we get ready for these meetings that Pastor Mike talked about. And also, a uh, big thing that's happening next weekend that's totally new to our church is we're doing something called Vintage Church. We're going to turn the clock back a little bit and do church a little differently. We're going to have a little experiment to kind of remember some of the practices that I know I grew up with and my parents grew up with. And then we're going to change Sabbath school a little bit too. There's going to be one church service next week, and the Sabbath school experience is going to be an intergenerational 
potluck. One of the reasons we're doing Vintage Church is because we have a very diverse congregation, and we have a lot of different age groups in our congregation. And because of the way communication changes and culture changes, sometimes different generations don't end up talking to each other. We get sort of separated. So we want to we wanna bring everyone together and have a unique, unique experience and practice what we call intergenerational ministry. And this potluck is going to have a couple things that we've been plotting, planning on to uh, help you with, and I think you're going to find it to be edifying. Um, but what's going to make it really successful is this potluck brunch next week is going to be wonderful as long as all of us bring something good to eat from home. So let's all bring our favorite things together for brunch. Let's plan on having a good brunch together, a fun brunch together as a Sabbath school experience, and we're going to have uh, something called Vintage Church, and it should be interesting and fun and looking forward to it. We are in a series called The Art of Church. This is our third one. Somebody shouted three last week and messed me up. This is our third one. And we are going through our, our mission statement. And one of the things that we want to do with The Art of Church is, first of all, when you talk about art, whether it's a painting or a sculpture or whatever medium of art it is, a work of art is not complete until someone has interacted with it and experienced it. And so church is not just this abstract thing. It is something we interact with. It's something we connect with and we respond to. It's, it, it requires involvement. And the other reason we want to look at church is because we are anticipating seeing many people give their hearts to Jesus, and we anticipate some of those people, a lot of those people, showing up here at church. And so it's good to remind ourselves why are we here and what are we doing so we can make sure that they have the best experience possible when they decide to become part of the family of God. Are you with me? Okay. So last week we looked at know Jesus, and there is a difference between knowing Jesus and knowing about Jesus. And we tend to do very good at knowing about Jesus with a very informational approach. But there is a deeper, imaginative, emotional experience that results in a deeper knowing. So we don't just want to know about Jesus. We want to know Jesus in a personal relationship. And so we're looking at the second half of our mission statement right now, which is share his love. So once we know Jesus and he changes our hearts and minds and our life, what, now what do we do? With that, what does sharing look like? How does sharing work? I want to give a couple caveats to the sermon. First of all, I'm going to start talking about one thing, and it's going to seem like it's not related, but it is. I will, we will get there. We will connect it, so don't freak out. The second thing I want to encourage you with, this sermon does have a point and an ending, which should make you very grateful to me <laughs> for doing that. Uh, but I make that statement simply because there is only so far a sermon can take you. At the end of a sermon or a song, or a book, at some point you have to say, what is God doing? How is he speaking to my heart? And what about this do I need to internalize and put into practice in my marriage, in my family, in my work, and in my church experience? I can't go through everyone's life in one sermon. We'd be here till next year and try to give advice. So we're going to give broad principles, and you will have to internalize it, because ultimately church is not about pastors. Church is about all of us, and all of us co-create with the Spirit of God, this community called church. And we're each going to have to internalize it and practice it and come together and, and make it something that glorifies Jesus with his help. Are you following me so far? So sermon has a point. There'll be application. But at the end, it's going to require a little bit more imaginative creativity on your part to, to ask yourself, what does that look like? And ultimately, what it means to become the church is not just become better Christians, but we're becoming better humans. Jesus created us to be wonderful beings made in his image. And so it's not just about becoming better churchgoers or better singers or, or, or better at whatever ministry you're involved with. We want to become the human beings that Jesus has created us to be. And we're going to learn about how that works today. So as has been our practice, I'm going to invite you to stand. Again, this is a relatively new practice. In about a month, we are reading scripture together. We're going to read the Bible verse together. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2. We'll throw it on the screen for you. And I like to give a little bit of direction before we read together because we don't want to mumble through the word of God and grumble through it because that's not inspiring. We want to do really, really well. And first service did a good job, so they set the bar high again. So you'll see there's little italics on some words. And what I want you to do, the last couple times we've read this, I've had you put an emphasis on certain words, sort of like you know, spitting them out, being incredulous, sort of disturbed by them. I want you to do something different. We're going to emphasize these words, but I want you to emphasize it in a way that's like an aha moment, like the light bulb is going along, like you've discovered penicillin or gold or a cure for cancer. You've discovered something amazing. So that's the tone with these words. So let's read this together. Again, by the way, this is a description of, of the early church. It's, it's, it's first moments. Let's read it together. 
And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as had any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Beautiful. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you for calling us into this community called church. Thank you for bringing us here this morning. Lord, guard our hearts and minds from every distraction, every stress, every frustration as we seek to become your body, your hands and feet and eyes and ears to help heal a very broken and divided world. Lord, I pray that your spirit takes the words spoken, the lessons studied, and shapes it in a way that just fits our life perfectly. Unlock our sanctified imagination to know how to live church, how to live a relationship with you. Jesus, if all we have to offer is information here, people don't need us, they need Google or a library. Church has got to be more. Help us to be more and understand how we do this and how it affects everything else. Help us to not just know you, but to share your love, Jesus. We thank you and we praise your precious name for all that you do for us. And, and we said, amen. You may be seated. One of the strongest ministries of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is its educational system. It is the largest Christian educational system in the world next to the Roman Catholic Church. Ironically, the philosophy of this massive system of schools is rooted in the writings of a woman who had no more than a third grade education. A divinely inspired woman whose writings produced a philosophy of education that spans the entire globe from kindergarten through doctoral studies. In writing about this curriculum, here's what she says. And by the way, that should encourage some of you. You know, the fact that such an amazing thing was done by someone with a third grade education and the Spirit of God working in their life. Next time you fail a test and feel discouraged, remember what God can do. When you feel like you don't have the professional or academic credentials to make an impact of cultural significance, remember this what, what God enabled her to do. But here's what she says writing about Christian education manual training is deserving of far more attention than it has received in school. And schools should be established that in addition to the highest mental and moral culture shall provide the best possible facilities for what? Physical development and... Because kids love to work. They love it. Every time I tell my kids to do a chore, their eyes roll back in their heads with indescribable delight. Every chore is a cheer, every task is a treat, every job a jubilee in my house. At least that's what I tell them it should be when I'm exhorting them to do something. If that doesn't work, I start singing just a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down from Mary Poppins until they feel sufficiently motivated to complete the task that I've asked them to do. Ellen White makes this statement because she understands that education is more than a lecture. Learning involves more than information. She states in another place, true education means more than pursuing a certain course of study. It has to do with the whole person and with the whole period of existence possible to human beings. It is harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. It dovetails off of Jesus' words. You love the Lord with all your heart, all your strength, and all your mind. Ellen White wrote these words 114 years ago. And today, contemporary theologians, educators, and philosophers are backing her up. 
James K.A. Smith is a leading voice in postmodern theology and epistemology, the study of how we know what we know. And he criticizes contemporary Christian education with these words. I'll back up the slide here. Here's what he says. The end or the purpose of Christian education has been seen to be the dissemination and communication of Christian ideas rather than the formation of a what? Peculiar people. He could be an Adventist. In other words, our focus has been on informing people, not forming people. Several hundred years ago, the philosopher Descartes, who was wrestling with his own existential doubts, came up with a phrase that sort of soothed his soul. And you know it, even if you hate philosophy. I think, therefore, I am. And that philosophy crept into Christian education and the church, which basically communicated the idea that people, in terms of their being, or what technically we call ontology, people are primarily thinking things. People are more than thinking things. As an exercise, take a moment, and I want you to try thinking about thinking. Just think about your thinking. Don't think about a thought you've thunk. Think about your thinking. Are you thinking about what you're thinking? Are you thinking? Most of the time, we can't do that. What we, we end up thinking about something or of something or in relation to something. We, we, can't just, we can't just think about thinking. We're thinking of something. We're thinking of the beach. We're thinking of a nap. We're thinking of lunch. We're thinking, how long is this sermon going to be today? We've only just started. Before Descartes made his statement, another very gifted educator, theologian, philosopher, St. Augustine, said people aren't primarily thinking things. In terms of how they orient themselves to the world and move through the world, they don't necessarily think through it because they're not primarily thinkers. They are lovers. In other words, our orientation, our being is towards desire. And whatever our desire is aimed at forms the kind of person we are. It echoes Jesus' words in the Gospels. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, or you see some outward manifestation. And so James Smith, contemporary theologian, makes the point that, that most of what we live is not by what we know, but by know-how. Last week, we talked about how everyone has a, a life pattern, what we call a life structure. And that life structure is based on choices we make, based on how we imagine the good life is supposed to be. And our imaginations are created through the images that we encounter every day. Now, we talked about last week, how about 150 plus years ago, you were very lucky if you had one piece of art hanging in your house and maybe one family photo. How many images have you seen just this morning? All trying to shape your imagination, which shapes your life structure. We're gonna go a little bit deeper this week it's not, the life structure is actually a structure of feeling, which means that when you're operating in life, you tend to sense the world before you think about it. You feel your way through the world before you think about it. Now, let me clarify. We're not against thinking here. Thinking is good. We should do more thinking. But that's not primarily how we first orient ourselves to life. We have this fundamental precognition or pre-thinking way of interacting with the world that shapes what, who we are, what we know, and what we do. Let me give you an example. If you've grown up in a neighborhood all your life or grown up in a neighborhood for any length of time, you know how to find your way home, whether you're at the grocery store, the library, the mall, you just know where to go. You don't have to think about it. You probably have never even seen a map of your neighborhood. You just know no matter where I put you in your neighborhood, you will find your way home. You don't have to think about it until somebody who's not from that neighborhood shows up and says, hey, how do I get to the library? Ah. Oh. Okay, so I know it's that way, a while. <laughs> and you just go down, and then you take a left. I don't know the street name. You just, there's like a dog sometimes out there. Look, I'm just going to go with you. It's just easier that way. You can't explain it because you haven't had to think, of, you didn't think about it. You've just oriented yourself. Your rhythms of your life is, have been developed through how you sense around the world. And so James Smith says, an education then, now listen very carefully, is a constellation of practices, rituals, and routines to inculcate a particular vision of the good life by inscribing that vision in the heart. Education is about formation of the heart, not just inform information of the head. Education happens at the mall. 
It happens in the hall. It happens in the fall, sorry. I had a Dr. Seuss moment. <laughs> it happens at a football game. It happens at your dinner table. It happens at church. Education happens everywhere, which is why when someone criticizes Christian education by saying, I'm paying all this money for a Bible class, they have no clue what they're talking about. What you are paying for is the privilege of being in a culture full of ways of doing things that will actually form your child to be the kind of peculiar person that Jesus wants them to be. It is so much more than information. Christian education, and here's the link now when it comes to sharing Jesus, sharing his love. Christian education is a product of the church. And the church, in terms of our worship experience and our gatherings, are a product of people. How we live our life in our home and how we, how we do worship together in church. Now follow me very carefully here. An informational approach to life will lead to an informational approach to church, which will lead to an informational approach to education. And what will happen then is we will create a community of people who are well-informed but not well-formed. Are you following me? If our view of it, that the only thing that forms us and shapes us is new information, we will be completely blind to all the education that happens in terms of our life rituals and how we do life together. Church is so much more than information. Church is an informational art, not an informational. Church is a formational art, not an informational process. So Acts chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, I want you to go to Acts 2, the, the passage that we're looking at. In Acts chapter 2, what we have is a description of the way life was lived in the early church. It's not a lecture. It's not a lesson. It is a visualizing of what life was like. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. And I want you to pay close attention to just not necessarily what was spoken, not what was being taught, because it doesn't tell you in this passage. It just reveals how they practice life together. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread or having meals together and praying together. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes together, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Because people saw that, this community of sharing, it wasn't just about what was being taught, it was about how they were doing life and it was so much better than the surrounding culture that they were a part of. They shared everything, not because the government told them to, not because the Seventh-day Adventist General Conference decided to have the year of sharing, not because the apostles managed to make people feel guilty enough to bring something to potluck. Mm -hmm. It's because each of them, filled with the Holy Spirit, had such a radical vision of Jesus and what community could, could be that it shaped everything they did. It captured their sanctified imagination and they lived it out in creative ways. In Greek etiquette, when it comes to meals, everyone who eats together is equal. As a matter of fact, if you were to gossip at the banquet table about somebody else who was attending, it was as rude as an unexcused loud belch at a five-star restaurant. You just don't do that. Greco-Roman culture, when it came to practicing these meals, tended to keep these meals sort of even in terms of socioeconomic status. In other words, if you were attending these meetings, everyone would just kind of stay with their level. You didn't mix and mingle so much. Occasionally, you had a wealthy patron who would throw a banquet for people of the lower class, but he wouldn't necessarily or she wouldn't necessarily eat with them. They'd eat somewhere else. So you'd arrive, oh, we're so glad you're here. You're going to be eating in the riffraff room with all the other undesirables, and the patron's going to be over there with the important people. The early church, with this radical vision of Jesus, decided to introduce a new etiquette. We are going to have a meal, and no matter who you are, everyone can eat together and is equal. The ancient synagogue excelled at separating people. Men, women, Jews, Gentiles, everyone had their own separate place to be. The early church rejected that separation but they retained two things from the early synagogue. First of all, er, the early synagogue always had a dining hall and always had a hotel for travelers. So we're going to, in our culture, we're going to reject this separating influence, but we're going to bring everyone together and have different experience. If you go back to Acts chapter 2, 
and you start looking in verse 5, you start seeing the people that were brought together. It says, now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, devout, or excuse me, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. You go down to verse 9, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and conversions to Judaism, uh, Cretans and Arabians. Now, now th- how many differences are there gathered in one place? A lot. Different languages, different life experiences, yet they could all come and share the same meal in the same place in this new community called church. They could share with each other. Now, I want to be very careful. They did not homogenize the cultures. We don't want to get rid of diversity. I enjoy new cultures and new tastes, new sights, new sounds, new smells. I have some international travel planned this year for school. I can tell you right now, as much as I love America, there are places I don't necessarily want to see my own culture. When I'm in the Scottish Highlands, there better not be a Walmart up there. It's going to ruin it for me. They brought everyone together, as different as they were, and they learned to get along and share everything due to a vision of their Savior and a vision of what community could be until they lost it. Because the surrounding cultural idols and bigotry messed up their imagination. As a matter of fact, when you read through the epistles, Paul spends most of his time with exhortations and lamentations and exasperations, trying to get God's people back to that original vision of Jesus and what community was supposed to be, because they're dividing all the time. One of the best examples is Galatians, where you have this group of people who come in, and they tell these converts to Christianity who aren't Jewish, unless you alter your body, you can't be in the family of God. And they believe them. Let me clarify right away, you don't... You don't find salvation and you are not a part of the family of God because you alter your body. It's because of Jesus Christ dying for you and loving you and giving you grace and forgiveness. But these people are buying into it. And so Paul writes to them, he says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Now notice he says, who, he doesn't say who has misinformed you. No, he says, who has bewitched you? Who has been able to shape words and descriptions in such a way to capture your imagination and give you a different vision of what life is supposed to be? Education is so much more than information. We baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We baptize them in the name of a triune God who experiences perfect love and community within his being. We baptize people into community. We don't baptize them so they can forward emails, post clever things on Facebook, and sit next to strangers while they hear the pastor lecture every Sabbath. It is so much, it is so much bigger. It is so much more than that. We are baptized into a fellowship of believers whom Jesus has shown a vision of sharing a kind of life that leads, that leads us to become more loving, more human, and more like Jesus. One of the reasons that church is so stressful for a lot of people is because in terms of our practice, what we've taught people is to come to church and expect to receive something. Not come to church and expect to share something. Ironically, if everyone came to church to share something, we would all receive something. The way we have shaped church is not about sharing. And here's the thing, sharing isn't just about sharing your money or your food. Sometimes sharing involves sharing your time, attention, and your energy to people who are burning out in ministry. I know there's a lot of people who have talked to me and they said, you know, I, I, I sense that I need to be involved, I sense that I need to share, but I don't have this one thing, I don't have this one position I feel called to, so I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to know I'm supposed to be involved somehow. Let me give you, let me give you an idea. Perhaps the thing you are called to is to lend your energy to those people who do know the position that they're called into. That your job is to be a source of cheer and encouragement and energy and help to those people who do know what positions they're supposed to be called into. By the way, what I'm describing here, we have a name for it. It's called pastoring. Pastoring is encouraging and equipping and cheering other people on in their ministry. And you don't need to collect a check from the conference to do it. You can pastor your peers and develop a spirit of sharing in this church. When you share, the, the, I mean, the place you start is you, we are experts on our own life experiences, our own questions, struggles, and victories. Our starting point is just sharing life together. 
1 John 1, 1 to 3. Listen to how the early disciples described their spiritual experience. That's what was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. That should be eyes, not yes. Which we have looked upon. Now catch this part. Which we have what? We've touched. With our hands concerning the word of life. It's not all up in here. It is a, it is a whole way of doing life that we want to proclaim to you not so that you can be well informed, but so that you can have fellowship and sharing in this community, this culture with us. It is so much more than information. You witness and you share Jesus' love by how you share and practice your life with others, your creativity, your resources, your table, the way you speak to others as you share your story and invite others to share their story with you. Church, for too long, has been more about programming than sharing. It's about maintaining programs, not maintaining relationships and sharing. Now, church changes as we go through the centuries and the decades, and it's futile to try to go back to a 19th century New England church framework or a first century Palestinian church framework and and retrofit it onto 21st century Washington church. But as we look back, sometimes we get some insights into the spirit and the character of what shaped those early communities that were so effective. So I want to walk back a little bit. The Adventist church came out of the Millerite movement, which put all its hopes on the fact that Jesus was coming in 1844. He didn't, by the way, just in case you were wondering. And yet, that early Adventist movement didn't lose their vision of Jesus, their vision of heaven, and what that meant. That vision of Jesus' soon return oriented their entire life practices. And church looked very different in the 19th century than it does now. If we were Seventh-day Adventists in 1860, 1870, 1880, and so on, you wouldn't have three pastors at this church. You wouldn't have one pastor at this church. As late as 1912, people like A.G. Daniels, who was the general conference president, wrote and described the churches in this way. We'll throw this on the screen. We have not settled our ministers over churches as pastors to any large extent. Our brethren and sisters, that's you and me, have held themselves ready to maintain their church service and carry forward their church work without settled pastors. Ellen White writes that we are to highly respect the position of of pastors, but to build up yourselves. She says, when you assemble in the house of God, and here's where the Christian education part comes in, when you assemble in the house of God, tell your experience, in other words, share, And you will grow stronger. When you speak in meeting, you are gaining an education that will enable you to work for others. By cultivating a culture of sharing, building in that practice here, getting into that rhythm here, that's what enables us to go sharing out there. That's not typically how we form church. Every form of communication has what we call an intertext, meaning it's not just the content of your message that influences people, it's the shape that it takes. So, in other words, how church is conducted teaches people how to be Christians sometimes more than a sermon ever could. Let me give you some examples. I remember pastoring a church where the people hated each other. They didn't like each other, They didn't like gathering together. The only source of joy in their life was when they got to get away from each other after the service was done. Which tells you that you don't want to be a church. Church is not a place to come and find family and friends and relationships. You're communicating, regardless of what the sermon says. There are other models of church, and I fear this is a predominant one in Western North American culture, is that church is a place where a few highly energetic, highly gifted people burn themselves out where everybody else gets to watch. There are models of church where people say, you know, it's just easier to stay at home, watch online, and do our own thing, which is reinforcing a 21st century American consumerist individualist ideology, not a Jesus community theology. How you practice church forms people as much, every bit as much as how you preach and teach church. Ellen White even goes so far as to say, our people should not be made to think that they need to listen to a sermon every Sabbath. Whoa, Ellen, let's not get a little carried away. I mean, when you look at Pentecost, Peter preaches a pretty good sermon, and then you have this church experience. 
She says, often it would be more profitable if the Sabbath meetings were of the same nature as a Bible study class. She's not against sermons. She preached sermons. What she's doing is trying to correct an imbalance. Listen to me. When we arrive at a worship experience where everything is done for us by a few of us, none of us will ever become what Jesus has called us to be. When I was in Peru a few years ago on a mission trip, we were on the mission base, and the director said that his brother, who was a pastor in Brazil, I believe it was, got a new job. He was a pastor, and he had been pastoring 15 churches. Now, I'm not talking he pastored 15 churches in his career. I mean, actively at one time, he was pastoring 15 churches. We call that a super district. And his new job moved him to 10 churches. Now, every pastor in North America would say, hallelujah, <laughs> time to praise the Lord. I only have 10 and not 15, but his brother viewed it as a demotion. Because there you have to understand that, that a pastor's role is to create communities that form people, not gather audiences to inform people, which is why the bulk of the church, by the way, is no longer in North America. Because the communities around the world have not become clergy dependent. They have realized that we do this thing called church together. We share together. We do life together to reinforce a Jesus culture together to take that elsewhere, not just sit and listen to a sermon or somebody sing a song once a week. The art of church is about forming people, not just infor informing people. Adventist Christians believe in a unity of body and mind. We don't believe in an immortal spirit that leaves the body and is all ethereal and floats somewhere forever. We believe that a human being, their mind and their body are linked, which means that the Adventist message is not primarily or not solely about getting the right doctrines and thoughts in your head. It is about embodying the truth in a loving way way that seeks to imaginatively bring those truths and doctrines to life. In a few weeks, we are starting a series that is going to bring new people to this church. We have new people, and by the way, welcome if you're a visitor. Again, we're glad that you're here. We have visitors every week, and we are anticipating new people coming in. And what I want to ask you, church, Puyallup Seventh-day Adventist Church, is what do you want to teach them? They'll hear sermons from Pastor Seth, Pastor Mike, and Pastor Natalie, but what do you, sitting here right now or listening, what, you will teach them more about church than I will. Your practices, how you do church, will teach them way more about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a community than I will. And the good news is, is that Puyallup, up, I have some pastoral pride about our congregation. We do some pretty amazing things. We read scripture together to reinforce the idea that the Bible is not just for pastors or people on the platform. It is for everybody. God can speak to anybody. We have corporate singing. By the way, if you go look at the history of, of worship, liturgics in Christian history, there were times where congregational singing was banned in church. It was heretical. But here we have everybody sing together to reinforce the idea that every voice matters to Jesus even if it sings in the key of awful. When you visit our church, we put together a good welcome bag with good chocolate. We save Hershey's for the members. But when you are a visitor, we give you good chocolate because we want you to have a sense that even if you don't feel welcome in your home, with your family, at work or school, you are welcome in this place. When church service ends, even when the pastor goes a little long, People don't bolt after the final amen. Every Sabbath, there are loiterers in this congregation who sit here in the sanctuary and share with each other, which reinforces the idea that church is not pri pri primarily a program. It is about connecting people and creating a community that reflects the love of Jesus. But there is more we can do to grow. And so this is my challenge to you where you're going to have to ask Jesus to help your sanctified imagination. Those of you who are involved, those of you who are not involved, Those of you who feel like you have a relationship with Jesus, how do you want to structure your ministries, your families, and your church so we, we, we form people? What kind of people do you want to form? How do you want to teach people? What are your Sabbath schools going to look like? What are your dinner tables going to look like? What's your Sabbath morning rhythm going to look like? Because that will do more teaching than any sermon or Bible study. How do you want to model this thing? 
What do you want to change? When people come here, as your children are growing up here, what education do you want to give them? I want to invite you to stand with me as we close for prayer and recommit ourselves to imagining new ways of not just in, being informational about church, but practicing this. We do this together. This is not all about the pastors. This is about all of us. What, I can't wait to hear your ideas and see your ideas and hear your testimonies. Before we pray, I want to give one gospel note on this. This message is not about becoming a, a type A workaholic and just working harder at being a Christian. Because part of modeling Christianity and modeling church is our ability to receive forgiveness and grace for our shortcomings when we don't have all the answers or all the energy. And by simply being willing to receive grace and forgiveness, not just from Jesus, but being able to receive it from yourself when things don't go the way you want, you will model Christianity here. So tuck that one away. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, we want to be a group of people who share your love in a way that doesn't just inform people, but it forms people. Jesus, there are so many things I am grateful for in this church. I know there are so many creative things that we haven't thought of yet that you will bring to the forefront this year that will create a culture of sharing, of community, over against the wider culture of idolatry and bigotry. That this will become a place where we serve each other and serve you in such a powerful, demonstrative way that it changes our character and our practices, whether we are at church service or board meeting or a committee meeting. Whatever we are, it will change us and it will become so powerful, it will just naturally spill over into the way we talk and the way we live around other people who are not in our church community. And they will marvel at that. As scripture says, awe will come upon them and you will add to our numbers daily those who are being saved. Thank you for everyone here. Thank you for the privilege of being able to practice church. Thank you for good information, but may we go deeper than information and have transformation by your grace, the power of your spirit. We thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.